Hello, everybody. Welcome to the sixth episode of Beyond Talking Points. I'm Matthew with my co-host, Matt. We have we don't ha- have as many stories to cover today as we usually do because M- Matt was traveling. So, but but we have a a, a good good amount of material. Um, I don't actually have much to say, so I'll just let him jump right into the the first story. Yeah. So we're we're, we're so uh, let's just give a brief overview. We're we're gonna cover three topics generally. We're gonna talk a little bit about just the abortion debate in general because there's been a lot going on the last month or so. Then we're gonna cover um, an article from 2017 about Tulsi Gabbard that's just really interesting. Uh, I think interesting is the best word to describe it. <laughs> and then we're gonna talk a little bit. I don't know if you guys are following this, but there's been a little bit of a drama between Dave Rubin and Colette um, with the IDW, and they they wrote a piece said. Uh, kind of negative saying that they're more conservative we watched a video by roman millennial where she talked about it and we're going to comment on that a little bit but to intro the first topic um the main reason i wanted to talk about this we actually had planned on doing it a few weeks ago is because i'm in philadelphia and there was this whole uh, event here where brian sims is a representative of the pa house and he ended up yelling at some protesters in his district in front of a Planned Parenthood, and the video completely blew up. So the video that blew up was about three, it was three teenage girls with what I presume to be their mom praying outside of Planned Parenthood. And Brian Sims walks up to them, yells at them, tells them that what they're doing is racist, unchristian, and he offers, it's something like a Facebook Live or a Instagram Live, something like that. He offers $100 to anybody who can get their uh, names and address, essentially, so he can dox them. Uh, so that wasn't a good look on him. Then when that video came out, there was another one where he did very similar things to an older woman. Um, and this led to like a huge thousand person counter protest in the city. Um, so that was a whole event. And then that, that, that spurred me on into wanting to talk about the issue because I think the abortion issue is kind of ridiculous. I think it's two people, two sides talking past each other. And then, um, my, my co-host is going to talk a little bit about the, the laws that have just passed that have just taken this conversation to the national stage all of a sudden in like the last two weeks. So you can go ahead and uh, talk about those a little bit. Thank you. So Georgia and Alabama uh, recently passed some legislation which would restrict abortion far more than already in, in those two states. Uh, t- to give a little background, there, there were, there are, both states are already pretty restricted generally. So in Georgia, um, if a woman is considering to have an, is wanting to have an abortion, uh, it, she is required to go to state mandated counseling where the counselor is supposed to discourage her from getting the abortion. Um, and she's supposed to wait 24 hours before the procedure is actually done. And... Uh, let's see. Parents of pregnant teens under the age of 18 must be notified before um, the abortion can can occur, and uh, it is no longer legal after 22 weeks. And now in Alabama, th- this is the uh, context. This isn't the, the law is passed yet. In in Alabama, uh, let's see. Oh yeah. Um, in th- well, uh, uh, sorry, I'm I'm stuttering. As long as the, uh, as well as the state mandated counseling in Alabama, there's a 48 hour waiting period. The parent, if if uh, minors, the, the parent has to consent to minors, uh, get to if a minor is wanting to get an abortion, the parents have to consent, and there are no abortions allowed after 21.6 weeks into the pregnancy. So, the the, the the laws passed would uh, sorry I'm just peering over my notes here in I think it's in Georgia that it would be illegal after six weeks completely illegal after six weeks uh, in Alabama it's complete. I think it's it's completely a banned except in the case of the woman's health. Uh, now, the, the, the laws haven't been enacted yet, 
in Alabama. I think it's going to be uh, going to go into effect in November, and in Georgia, it will go into effect in January of next year. So currently, the laws have not changed yet, uh, but they if the laws do change, or if, if these bills do go into effect, then, then it will certainly change. Uh, the, the, the bills are, though, in direct contrast, or in direct conflict with the 1973 decision, the Roe versus Wade, the Supreme Court decision. So that there will certainly be some, some people taking the, both states to court, and, and maybe they will not even be upheld. We'll, we'll see. Yeah. Sorry, I feel like I stuttered all that time. No, no, that's fine. You, you did a good job laying out the situation before these new laws passed. You gave, you explained what the laws are, and you explained, you know, kind of some of the implications of it. Um, well, as you're laying that out, it just it was striking me so much why I think this is a interesting conversation to have. Um, I think it's simultaneously very complex and very simple. I think it's there's a lot of different things you can talk about. You can talk about the political implications when it comes to say like the Supreme Court, you can talk about the political rhetoric on both sides, you, and you can talk about the actual like issue at hand. Um, so I think there's a lot of elements you can cover just on this one topic, which is more, 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 which is more so the most topics. With a lot of topics, you can just point out, this is the goal of the policy. Will this policy meet the goal? Do it, and here's the evidence for or against. This clearly isn't that kind of situation, which I think is why um, it ends up striking so much debate. Um, and I think that's why it's a lot of just two sides talking past each other in a kind of a meaningless uh, flurry of rhetoric that is just heightened and doesn't, uh, it's not productive in any way. Uh, so like I'm the resident libertarian, but the, the and l typically libertarian party is associated with, you know, a, like a Democrat on social issues. For, for, for short, when I was in high school, they called libertarians uh, essentially Democrats on social issues, Republicans on economic issues. And I find that completely stupid because that misses the point of being a libertarian. It's just the general theory of small government. And then l Democrats on social issues are generally for small government. Um, but the case with abortion is when you simplify it, the real difference is half of America thinks a fetus is essentially a human life worth protecting and half doesn't. And if you don't, then why should abortion be illegal? And if it is, then there's no circumstance where abortion should really be legal. Even if you're a libertarian, if it's worth being protected, then obviously, even with small government, you'd be anti-abortion. So I don't even think it's like a libertarian government size conversation. So I just want to address that quickly because I don't want to sound like I'm contradicting myself as the libertarian on the show and then saying I'm how I fall into it regardless of that. Um, so I feel like especially with all what everybody's saying after these laws pass, people are just talking past each other. You turn on Saturday Night Live and a comedy show and you get Le Leslie Jones yells about how men are trying to take over your bodies because they want to control you. And then Republicans talk about how the other side wants to murder babies. And it's just because they don't agree with the basic facts of the issue. It, do you think I'm... yeah? Okay, so, so that, that's my initial take, and that's what drives me the most insane about the conversation. So, well, I, before I proceed, I'm, I'm, I want to make sure I understand your position. Would you say on, on the – you kind of feel as if the debate is a bit phony? Um, you, I mean, you feel it's as if it's you know, two people who can't have a reasonable discussion together, or two groups of people? Yeah, it's just – complete talking past each other. It's like they're unable to empathize with the other person's premises and they both disagree on premises. So they assume malintent, right? But what is your general take on, on abortion? Well, so I, I think the, the, the question that should essentially decide where you fall is, should the life be protected? And the way I see it is, it has its own unique DNA. It's not an extension of the mother. It's its own. It's a it's a developing human just before coming through the birth canal. So it's like how an infant is on its stages of development and uh, childhood. A fetus is just a uh, human DNA, you know, developing, but you know, to the baby phases. It just hasn't gone through the birth canal yet. So I, I'm generally pro-life just because that's I see that as some sort of human, even though it technically hasn't been born yet. Um, yeah, that's where I end up standing. 
I well, I mentioned to you a, a, a few weeks ago, I think, before or after the previous show, how um, I'm not a huge fan of this topic just because I agree with you that it's two sides who can't see eye to eye on, on anything because of the premises, the, the, because they disagree on, on the premises yeah. of, of the question. Um, and I just find generally that these conversations end up being very emotional. Um, particularly, I have to say, with women who are pro-choice. <laughs> I mean, there are some women in, in the family, in my family, who are pro-choice. Um, and I feel like I can't even discuss the issue with them because, you know, if you raise any question of, of if you raise the life question at all, it, it doesn't even matter, uh, you know, it, even if you're not saying that it's a life from the, you know, conception, even if you're saying more moderate, well, I would say it's a life up to, a, you know, how, wherever you draw the line. If you're if you're not completely abort, you know, if you're not completely gun ho 100% of the time, I, at least, this is my experience. I feel like they get very angry with you. Like, how dare you? <laughs> how dare you tell me, you know, what I should do or what women should do with their body? Um, you know, that, that is not a life, uh, you know. And I, <laughs> sorry, go ahead. No, like, um, I, I agree. I mean, I, I don't want to assume that there are. I mean, I, I don't want to go down that line too much because then we w I don't want to accidentally imply that a pro-choice person can't have a valid position. No, no, but no, no. But it, it, it does quickly get very easily – it's such a personal issue. I mean, it, and it's such a gray area, and I don't think people like to even think about it a lot of the time. But it's also that hmm, – I'm conflicted because in general, I like to downplay rhetoric – I, I don't think rhetoric is actually that important in the sense that, like, I don't think a politician saying something heated is actually likely to uh, influence opinion. Um, on the other hand, <laughs> the, the the thoughts on abortion are generally just both so siloed that it's it's one of the few times where I actually think that might be the case because the side of pro-choice is so heavily in the camp of this is clearly a right to my body. And it seems like that every time I hear somebody try to defend that position, I'm, I'm very not, I'm not convinced by it. Um, and then it's all, but, but once you go into the language of rights, then it's really hard to argue with somebody, which is why it's hard to convince me on stuff when we were discussing and I'm a libertarian and I'm like, well, yeah, but this is my right to my income. It's hard to persuade people once they think of things as rights. So I think they, they're really convinced on that way. And if your mindset is, it's not a, ba it's not a baby, it's not a human soul you know, I can do whatever I want, then it's very easy to, it's very easy to, to stay in that side and not even empathize and to assume because it, it's an intuition, right? They have this strong intuition that, you know what, like you don't have any memories from when you're, before you're born. You're not really a person. And that's just like this heightened intuition. And they, they can't even empathize with the pro-choice part, the pro, uh, the, yeah, I mean, the, the pro-life people who are just like, you're baby killers. So they, they assume that when they call get called baby killers, the other people are just dishonest and they want to control them. And I, yeah, it, it's an interesting narrative that I don't see any real evidence for, but I hear it over and over again. So it sounds I like you're moderately pro-life. That's what I'm hearing. You know, this might sound like a cop out, and I'll try my best not to make it sound like a cop out. <laughs> but I think you could really put me in either category with caveats. So you could really oh. call me a pro choicer with caveats or a pro lifer with caveats. Um, I think. I think it could. It is a very. Uh, I am very. I'm also. I'm very conflicted on the issue. Um, because, you know, while I, I do think, you know, I'm not, uh, I don't really believe in, in the soul or, or in life after death or anything like that. So I believe, you know, we're material beings. <laughs> and uh, obviously, um, we were all fetuses once. <laughs> we, we were all, any, I mean, everyone that's born was once a fetus that developed to conception. So I, I certainly do believe that 
the life question does come into play. Um, on the other hand, I don't think we can completely ban abortion. Um, because I, I think in certain instances, it's a it's kind of like a safeguard. I mean, you don't want to have to use the safeguard. I, I mean, there are probably some radical feminists who might say, "Oh yeah, I w you know I'm glad I want to get an abortion." <laughs> well, you have, think, the, you have the shout your abortion people. Yeah, you yeah, but, but I think one in five. Yeah, I think most people would say, you know, if, if in a perfect world, abortion would not be necessary. I agree with this. Uh, I, I, I just, but I do think in certain circumstances, it, it is better than the alternative. And I'll, I'll say one more thing. Um, I, I think it was an interview with the the Australian philosopher Peter Singer. I don't know if you're familiar oh, yeah, yeah, with him. Yeah, yeah. He's yeah. a hardcore he's mainly known for he's mainly like known effective altruism, right? Yeah, he's mainly known for his uh, anim, animal advocating yeah. for animal rights. Um, he's a vegan against, you know, all that stuff. So he, I, I can't, I obviously I can't, I don't have the quote pulled up here, but he said something as if, um, equal rights does not mean equal, uh, consideration, something, something to that effect. Um, and I, I would say generally speaking, I, I, I think I agree with that. I think... And my, my position on abortion, I guess, if I had to lay it out, is pretty much this. In the first trimester, I think it should almost, you know, pretty much free ride or you know, free abortion. Or, or pretty, I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm really sorry. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, a lot going on. But <laughs> to, um, to, to sum up my position on abortion, it is, uh, you know, pretty much abortion all the way in the first trimester in the second trimester, some restrictions. In the third trimester, even further restrictions. That's my position, uh, uh, generally. Okay, so, okay, so, so, so you reminded me of a few things in that whole thing. So one, when, when you brought up some abstract philosophical things for a moment, um, one thing that I hate about the abortion discussion is it's so hard to be, uh, I, I would consider myself an agnostic. Um, I'm not confident enough uh, to be an atheist or a deist, I don't have intrinsic beliefs, so I've never fallen into any, any like you know, r r I, I don't believe in anything. Let's just put it that way. But but I don't. I'm not going to take a stand like an atheist would. Um, I hate how this this whole debate is predicated around religion because when you look at the pro uh, pro life side, it's so heavily dominated by religious voices. And I think the case for being pro life is completely rational. I don't think you need to cite anything. I don't think you need to invoke the sanctity of life. But like I understand that argument if you think that you have to derive principles such as life has value from the Bible. If you don't believe that without the Bible, then it's like, okay, then you do need to cite religion. But we're at a point where most people take that for granted in the heavy, heavily secular society, like murder is illegal. So we've already agreed that life to some extent is somewhat sacred, right? I think that's just generally agreed upon even by secular folks. So I think if you start with that premise, that's really the only like religious premise you need. Um, anything else is just over the top. You don't have to talk about how life is sacred to know that you know, it's like if you think this fetus is its own individual and it's a stage of development and it's a human with human DNA and it's growing, like I don't think you need to cite any biblical text for that to matter. Um, so I really hate that. Like, uh, as I mentioned, that whole protest was in Philadelphia, the counter protests. And I, I consider myself very strongly pro-life. And I considered going to it. But then when I watched the coverage, there were people who I, who I like and I think have interesting voices that were going to it. Yet I knew that it was going to be overwhelmingly religious. And I knew I would not fit in with the crowd. Um, and that, that's just how the debate kind of is. I, I think I don't think there's any real reason for that. Um, the next point I kind of wanted to say was uh, the, I, I used to be very moderate. Um, I used to have a lot of respect for moderate positions, and I don't really have respect for moderate positions. I'm not, I'm not, not trying to be edgy and controversial. It's just like I think it's one of those things where you have to pinpoint what makes the fetus need to be protected. And once you start making the practical case, um, if you recall through the last five episodes of the show, I've kind of mentioned that I'm a little bit of a Kantian in how I frame uh, political choices, where it's like I understand the end is – good, 
But if the means are bad, then I don't like it. And I understand that women are in horrible situations where they don't want to have a kid and it's terrible for them to have a kid and they don't want to be pregnant for nine months and then have to care for a kid. And it's like, but I don't think the answer is that based on my premises that I'm working with is abortion is okay, even if it's six weeks in. Um, now, like I would seed, you know, the morning after pill for, you know, br br for uh, fetuses that have already been conceived, but it conceived, but have just been conceived and, you know, like rape and incest, I would seed all those like right away. Like, okay, take those if we make the rest illegal. Um, like, I'm not going to take a stand over those ones like some people do. But like first trimester, like two months in, it's like, eh, like I understand why if you make the argument as a consequentialist, it makes sense. But based on my premises, I can't accept that as an ethical uh policy but i, I but it, in general you generally are more of a consequentialist in how you lay out policies so it kind of I, I understand why you'd come to that perspective i just i just don't think i could back it um i think i had a third thought but i lost it at some point in that rant <laughs> also P P peter singer i definitely have like three of his audiobooks that i'm going to check out from my uh for my audio uh from my uh, Philadelphia library. I have them already. Animal Liberation, and there's a couple others. So I'm excited to dig into his stuff. But he uh, he famously said something, well, infamously said something where he, he personally doesn't see much of a distinction between infanticide and abortion. He just kind of doesn't care because his framework is very consequentialist. So you might not want to take that perspective because that's kind of hard to defend, in my opinion. Uh, well, obviously, we'd have to dive deeper into Peter's or to, into Singer's work, which uh, I don't think we're going to in this one episode. <laughs> you know, ob <laughs> obviously, I, you know, I, with everyone, I agree with some things he says. I disagree with some things he says, and I agree. It uh, this this debate should not have to be religious. Um, and I I know. Again, I, I understand why people think that that's a cop out, <laughs> that that's not a defensible yeah. position. Being a moderate, I, I mean, I understand, and and I just, uh, you know, I think in some issues it is warranted, and other, on other issues, I just think it's not warranted, because I think, I don't think there is always a clear black and white, you know, yay nay, yay versus nay, right versus wrong, uh, answer, um, and I don't think, and I think abortion. As, as we both have conceded, is is a very you know gray area where you you know where do you draw the line of of life if you know where where do you draw the line of the woman's body or the woman's right to privacy or or the right to health care you know so okay I have, I have a last thought based on that before we move on um, because because that that is a very common pro choice type argument it's like it is sketchy moral territory, so leave it up to the mother. Is kind of a no, 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 no. I, 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 don't, I didn't actually say that, but okay. <laughs> okay. I, it, it just sounded similar to a sentiment I hear a lot, and I'm, I don't like that sentiment. No, so that's why. No, I was no, say I don't something. think. No, no. Well, let me clarify then, just to okay. um, be clear. I, I don't think that there are people who say, you know, this is a woman's issue. I don't agree with that. It's a humans. It's a human issue. I, I think. Every, I think, despite the fact that men will never have to get abortions, I think men can certainly can have a stake in the game. Uh, you know, and it's not always because the patriarchy. <laughs> yeah. Um. So. So. Yeah. No. I. I don't think. I. I. I uh. It, it's not about. Um. The. I. I don't think it's a woman's issue, and I, I don't think we should leave it up to the woman. Um, I, I guess if I'm okay with abortion in some respects, it, it probably would be more the, the consequentialist, more, more because of a of the outcome, ra rather than saying, you know, oh, I love abortion. Okay. So, so last thought for you. I'm, I'm glad you pointed that out. I'm just going to make an unrelated thought on this. Uh, the consequentialist arguments... I like I doubled down on how Kantian I am because I've heard so many of them like that there was that very popular econ book Freakonomics that like you know it led to a whole NPR radio show that's had like a thousand episodes and in the first Freakonomics book there's a whole study essentially about the crime wave and 
the author implies that the crime wave, the reason why uh, crime dropped off is actually because of the timing of Roe v. Wade and a lot of young people who would have been born in bad situations didn't grow up right at that area age range where they would would have grown up because they were probably aborted because their parents were single mothers or in very bad situations. And there's actually a good case for that. So consequentialists could cite that in favor of abortion. It's like, well, a lot of these kids are born into bad situations. They're more likely to become criminals or more likely to have harder lives. And I hear that. And I'm like, yeah, that would really suck. I feel a lot of empathy for the woman, feel a lot of empathy for the kids but I don't think it means you kill the fetus in the womb. I don't think that's the solution. And I think that's what, I think that's what a lot of pro-lifers hear when they hear the consequential stake. They're like, okay, I understand. We can work with all those things. We can work with the unintended consequences after we see that it's not worth killing the fetus. Um, but yeah, I, I totally get your perspective. I understand. It makes, I, it makes sense with your framework you're working with. I'm working with a different framework. And we, we've kind of worked through that a lot. So, yeah, okay. Um, so let's move on to talk a little bit about Tulsi Gabbard. Um, I think you're going to have a lot more thoughts on this because you, uh, I think in our first episode, or maybe it was just us talking, it was just us talking the first time we got to know each other. You, you specifically pointed out Tulsi is a girl you were a fan of. Um, and then we, we got this article all about her coming from a really... Is it? It's the left attacking the left because it's another piece from Jacobin Mag, which is uh, the one from the which is the Nietzsche article that we did. I, I think it's a, I think it's a Marxist website. Uh, yeah. So, so, so do you want to take a, you want to break, break down this hit piece? Cause it's, it's fascinating. Sure. I, I will say though, um, through all these, or at least these next, these last two stories we um, covered, I, I, there, there was one main takeaway, especially with this Gabbard piece. It, it is very in depth. There's a lot of, you know, areas we could go into uh it, it is uh, as i say it's on the jacobin website it's titled hello yeah yeah oh sorry i heard some feedback <laughs> in the microphone all right it's titled tulsi gabbard is not your friend it's subtitled uh tulsi gabbard is hailed as a progressive champion but her views on Islam and support for for far for far right leaders suggest otherwise. So right off the bat, you can tell, as you say, this is a left attacking the left issue, and this is actually an issue I see a lot on the left. Uh, people on the left are are never the to, are never left enough <laughs> for other people on the left. You're always you know secretly in 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 league with the fascists and the conservatives if, if you don't believe you know, this, that, or the other thing. And so that just, you know, really gets under my skin b because, well, especially when, when they start talking about the, the foreign policy, uh, her, her foreign policy, because it, it starts talking about, you know, oh, well, she supports this government or she had a conversation with this leader who, you know, oppressed his people in this respect, you know. And the, the world, you know, the world is a tricky place. <laughs> We're not always going to be able to associate with angels, <laughs> unfortunately. You know, maybe in a perfect world, all the good guys, you know, and, and the you, you would only have to associate with good people <laughs> or with um healthy people or constructive people, and that's just not how, how it works. But actually, the main reason I wanted to bring up this article was the topic of Islam. Uh, so the, the, whole, the main part of the main uh, t uh, argument in, in the article involving Islam is that she is Islamophobic. <laughs> uh, you know, that she, she's, a, she's racist against uh, Muslims, um, I think, uh, it, it, it talks about her, um, I think she, she made the point a while back that, uh, that, that, that immigration from certain countries, predominantly Islamic countries sh should be curtailed. Uh, and of course she's, she's, hin I should say, if you don't know, she's Hindu. Uh, I mean, she's a, she believes in, in Hinduism, uh, and, and, Hindus and Muslims have a <laughs> bad history, um, but but really, I just 
I'm using this kind of as a springboard to attack the idea of Islamophobia because I'm just really sick and tired of this term. Um, I've been called Islamophobic quite a few times, actually, in, in conversations with people on the left. It, <laughs> it just gets, it really gets under my skin because I think... I think we're not allowing ourselves to under to, to to criticize uh, aspects of Islam because we're we're equating it with any we're equating criticism with Islam with racism, and we're saying, do you you know did you criticize Islam on you know for this or that? Okay, well that means you know you're racist that you hate Arab people, <laughs> and that is clearly not the case. I mean, you can. You can make criticisms of Islam without being a racist. <laughs> In fact, I would say it's very easy to make criticisms of Islam without being racist. And it just so, you know, we don't have to go too deep into, you know, the, 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 the question of are all religions equal? Um, but I think it's, you know, it's, it, at this time in history at least, globally speaking what religion is causing the most chaos it's islam <laughs> and and i think i think we have to point that out and and i think i think gabbard does she's one of the few progressives who 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 do and i i will certainly stand by her in that respect uh, you know i don't again you know i'm not her so obviously i'm not going to agree with her on every single issue um, and there are other aspects of this article that maybe I, I'd agree with the the writer a bit more. I'm not sure. Um, she might be Gabbard might be a bit weak on foreign policy. I, I have to do more research to to give a firm grasp on that. But but, but that's that's really the the main thrust of of what I wanted to talk about. Okay. Um. So, but before I wish I comment on it, I do want to point out that in like the last five minutes, right when you started talking, uh, since I live in Philadelphia and the weather's stupid, it's uh, pouring and thunderstorms out all of a sudden. So if you hear just thunder, you know, booming, you know, just ignore it. I'm fine. I'm inside. I'm good. Um, okay. So let's, I'm just going to jump on the Islamophobia part. I don't need to talk about the rest of the piece. The, the real tension in the talk about Islamic terrorism is a, there's a large amount of people who think it's because of the ideology of Islam and the, the, the strict reading of it, and then what, what, what follows from a strict reading of it. And then there's a lot of people who essentially say, um, terrorists do what they do because of what we do to them, and then they see the carnage, and then they retaliate. So th this magazine clearly only buys that second view as legitimate. They only think the issue is we show up there, they're upset, which creates uh, lifelong terrorists that want to destroy our nation because we've wrecked carnage in their country. Um, it, and it's then, ideology versus foreign policy, basically. So the, the thing is, I get kind of annoyed because I think both things are clearly at play. Like, yeah, if a lot of uh, innocent people get killed when we put when we drop missiles in the Middle East. So if somebody knows that a family they knew or maybe a member of their family got killed, because of a U.S. bomb, then they're more likely to buy into an ideology that it, you know, villainizes the U.S. and Western culture and wants to attack it. Like, hey, that makes plenty of sense. I buy that theory. You know, that's reasonable. So the, the thing is, if you acknowledge that there are things in Islam itself that, uh, well, what's the word for it? Heighten the, the, this radicalization and aggression or things that can easily be cited to promote terrorist activity, that, that's when you get called Islamophobic. And it's clearly unfair. Um, that There's that famous Sam Harris on Bill Maher when he's talking to, uh, what, what, what celebrity was that? God, who was Ben it? Affleck. Yeah, Ben Affleck. And Ben Affleck just is calling Sam Harris all these names. And I, I've read... A, and Bill Maher. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I've, I've been following Sam Harris for a couple of years, and I read, uh, what was his uh, first book? His first book was, um, crap. It, was, it, was that The End of Faith or The Letter to a it, Christian Nation? I think it was The End of Faith. I've, I've read both those. But in The End of Faith, I'm pretty sure it's that book. There is a poll that is disturbing, and it polls a bunch of people who are, um, or who are, who are, believe, uh, 
believe in the Islamic religion and it's how what, 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 in different countries, what percentage of those people believed in suicide bombings to kill innocent people in defense of their religion. And the numbers were astonishingly high in some countries and even in some countries where it was like 20% or 15%, those are still big numbers when it comes to, you know, straight up saying you're willing to kill innocent people in defense of your religion. So that's terrifying and it seems like ideology is somewhat in play. Um, and I don't blame Tulsi for calling that out. I, I definitely didn't expect you to take th this route off the article. I thought you were going to defend her being an anti-interventionist more um, because this article attacks her cred there. But yeah, I think that, yeah, I, I think people get the Islam issue wrong. But but here's the thing. I, you, you sound more strongly anti-Islam than I am. Um, if you eradicated Islam from our world, I don't think the Middle East oppression would suddenly disappear. I think Islam is used as a weapon to perpetuate, you know, the like, like, like patriarchy is actually a fitting word in the Middle East where men literally dominate their wives. So I think that there is a patriarchy there and I think they weaponize their, their religion and read it in the strictest sense to reinforce that for decades and decades through different leadership and so forth and to get people to buy into their stuff. Um, but do I think that without the religion, this wouldn't happen? No. Like, I don't believe in secular utopias, right? I, I don't think all evil stems from religion. I think there's just some evil in some people. And I think there are plenty of uh, dominant uh, evil doing people, probably in like uh, countries in Africa. There's probably some dictators there that are relatively secular that don't cite a religion to dominate people. Um, so I don't think that would cure all the ills, but I definitely think there's some sort of relationship between Islam. Um, I'd no. like, can I can I jump in here when I, for a moment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't mean to interrupt you. Go, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, I, I'm not sure there's a really a single word of that that I disagree with. Um, I, I guess let, let me take a a bit more nuanced position uh, when, when I when I'm talking about Islam. Well, I should say that uh, I am. I am an a I am an agnostic atheist. Uh, I know people say that's a contradiction in terms, but it's not, <laughs> and I can go into that maybe at another date. But so, and I've also been very influenced by the new atheist movement. So, uh, I I, sh I guess I should say that that is my background uh, in, in in intellectually on, in this arena. Uh, do do I think do, do I think that Islam needs to be eradicated? No, I do not. Do I think it can be eradicated? <laughs> no, I do not. I, I think... I, I do think religion is an evil on this, on this earth. <laughs> and I do think religion causes a heck of a lot of damage. But I think... And I, and I think probably quite several new atheists, at least Christopher Hitchens I know, would agree with this. I, I think it's just a, a part of the human personality. I, I don't think religion... Unless we change human nature, <clears throat> unless we change human nature, which I'm very skeptical of, <laughs> I don't think it'll, religion will ever go away. And so, I, I suppose I take a maybe a bit of a pragmatic point on this. I, I do think that our goal should be to empower the moderates of Islam, because I think, generally speaking, not not completely, but generally speaking, the moderates of Judaism and Christianity have won at least in uh, the United States and Europe. It, it might be a bit different uh, in other, in, in other uh, places on, on the planet. But I think, generally speaking, the moderates of those two religions have, have dominated. And I think we just need to you know, give Islam a little push um, in, intellectually. I mean, we, we need, we, that's what, what I mean by, you know, I, I think we should talk about this issue so, so we can help, um, help them. You know, I, I think this will... It, 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 if if and when reform comes to Islam, and I think it can come, it will probably come from the inside. You know, I, I, I don't think, you know, you're not from an Islamic culture, neither am I. <laughs> so I, I don't think, I, I don't think we have as much control over, over that culture. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I, so I wouldn't say I'm, I mean, I'm anti all religions, <laughs> but I wouldn't. I, I would not go so far as to say that, um, you know, we have to destroy Islam. 
So, this I, I is where... Okay. Wait, wait, I guess, I'm sorry. I have one more quick point. <laughs> and I, I, I am a bit passionate on this issue, but I'll, one more quick point. Um, if I think there's a... If I think there's a distinction between Islam and, and some of the other religions, I, I think it, it is this one thing. And, and, I, and I actually went to a mosque not too long ago and, and talked to a guy there. I talked to the, the leader. I, I forget the, the name of their religious leaders, but Imams. I talked to this. Probably. I think it's yeah. Yeah, an imam. I talked to this gentleman about Islam because you know, I wanted to learn a bit more about it from, the, you know, from an insider's perspective. And he said something that was striking to me. He said, uh, I'm sure you'll fam you're familiar with the quote, uh, the, a quote from the Bible where Jesus says, give unto Caesar, Caesar's due. Wh which generally, I mean, of course you can go, in, then this is the question, th this goes into biblical criticism, which I don't want to go too deeply into. But generally speaking, people interpret that line as meaning, you know, politics is here, religion is here, you know, that th they're not. Uh, one and the same and it, he, this guy said to me we don't islam or muslims don't believe jesus said or don't believe in that idea that they believe that religion and politics are not exactly one and the same but are heavily heavily connected and i think that that is the real distinction between islam and and perhaps uh, judaism and christianity uh, and, and I think that that part of Islam needs to be uh, mo moderated, if not maybe disposed of completely. Um, but again, I, I don't I'm not, you know, advocating complete eradication of Islam. I'm not advocating any, you know, discrimination against Muslims. Uh, and, yeah. So. OK, so the, the main thing that I wanted. To, OK, so, so I was going to say two things. One. Yeah, I'm, I'm. I'm not against empowering the more moderate, the more moderate Muslims to to take over their religion and essentially make make it so it's not remotely violent and they don't promote terrorism. Like that's more of an empirical question of like, what do you think is the most effective way to resolve this crisis and all these religious domination going on in the Middle East and stuff like that, and how ideology plays into that. I feel like there's probably a, a solid answer that's kind of unquestionable if you really gamed it out. Um, now, I kind of drew, well, what was the word for it? I'm familiar with the New Atheists. Um, I don't find them particularly, I don't find their explanations of things satisfying at all. And uh, this is me being a person who does not have belief. I, I think their arguments against religion as a whole um, are kind of misleading. Like Christopher Hitchens, a lot of his work, I think he blames a lot of things on religion that are not religion's faults. He will take things that are to take place in a religious structure or wars that are like religious based and then imply that the status quo would have been different if they just hypothetically weren't religious. Um, there, there are things like that where I don't think religion is the cause. I think religion is related. Um, but I, I, I find that they kind of just misread it in a way that is unsatisfying and kind of first level, which is why I'm not super into them. But I, well, once again, I have uh, the God Delusion on hold right now. I'm about to listen to that audiobook in like a week, so we'll check that out. But yeah, I'm I'm familiar with a lot of Sam Harris's stuff, and it's like like you could read the text literally, and then you could say this clearly is saying you should kill somebody. That's clearly bad. Um, but a lot of people start with religious foundations and they do a lot of good in the world. And I wouldn't say that the world would be a better place historically if there was no religion. I think there are a lot of benefits of religion that have led into a lot of Western civilization that are really good. Um, so I would probably disagree with you on that, but that's more than we have time for because we're already at like the 40 something minute mark. So we should probably jump into talking about the IDW a bit. And you can have a last thought because I'm not... I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not the monopolizer of last words on every issue. <laughs> um, I'm sure we'll we'll dive into this uh, new atheist, um, n dive into the new atheist movement and and you know questions of of religion more uh, in in further episodes because you know when when is religion not a topic of discussion? <laughs> when is it not important? Um, I, I will just say before you move on, I, I sense, I, I could be wrong, but I sense that your argument you just gave 
sounds very similar to the Jordan Peterson argument in favor of faith. And I, I, as, as I told you, I think before, I agree with Peterson maybe 50% of the time. But on, on religion, I, I think he's dead wrong. And I, and I, uh, I do believe that, as I said, religion has, does cause a lot of evil that would not exist without it. But, again, you know, human nature is fallible, and I think religion is just... Some, it's something that has to be dealt with, and I think can be dealt with in better or worse ways. Uh, I'll leave it there. Yeah, so we'll agree to completely disagree on that one for now, and then we'll tackle that. Pr- probably the next time we find something noteworthy about Jordan Peterson, maybe maybe, maybe we'll launch that into a... We'll springboard off that to a bigger discussion. So the, art, the the video we were watching is a uh, it's from the, the roaming millennial Lori Chen. I'm I'm actually a fan of hers. I started listening to her maybe 6 or 7 months ago her podcast. She recently rebranded to have a show. She does a little longer form show. Um she has a 15 minute YouTube video up called Dave Rubin and the IDW actually conservatives partisans and she kind of talks about how there was this Killette magazine article that criticized the IDW criticized Dave Rubin a lot. Um, and it pretty much said they're kind of all the same because all they do is they bash on SJWs and that's really their identity as a group. This is what their tribe is really for. And uh, yeah, so then, <laughs> so I'm a big fan of a lot of people in that circle. I listen to Joe Rogan, I listen to Shapiro, I listen to all these, all the crossover in there. I listen to Sam Harris. I listen to whenever Brett and uh, Eric Weinstein are put on a podcast. I love that stuff. I love Jonathan Haidt, all those guys. I've read a lot of their work. I've listened to a lot of their stuff. Um, oh, and I forgot Shermer and Steven Pinker and even more. So I, I find when they're called kind of homogenous, I think it's funny when they get branded conservatives because in general, they're usually center left or left on the average. Um, but they're just, they, they are generally all anti SJW. So if you felt the need to take the group and categorize, characterize them off one characteristic, that is the one thing they're all in favor of. The, I mean, they're all in favor of free speech and they're all against the general SJW anti free speech sentiment that comes with, you know, silencing people with say like, uh, trigger warnings and microaggressions and worrying about that. And you can see that if you read uh, Jonathan Haidt's new book with, uh, oh my God, I cannot remember his co-author's name. I feel bad about that because he's also an interesting uh, figure. The Coddling of the American Mind is a great book and it kind of is just attacking the social justice culture for about 300 pages. Um, So on one hand, that's how you could characterize them, but I don't think you should because they're all very different people if you read into their work, they all have very different views. And I don't think they are that simple. This is just the human need to characterize, uh, categorize things. And I think it's ridiculous to even bother with them. Um, but I don't know if you had stronger thoughts. Uh, as I mentioned before, I actually, there was just one particular topic that I wanted to tackle with, the, with this, uh, th- this YouTube video and, and the article that, that she linked to. I, uh, yeah, I think I, I generally, agree with you there i i think uh i don't think we can categorize the intellectual dark web as uh, right or right wing or or you know alt-right or you know this is just another way to smear people you know get over it <laughs> uh, that's really all i have to say about that what, what i actually really wanted to talk about and, and i think we'll completely disagree about this um so maybe you know that's Good. <laughs> Maybe that'll give us some a good, uh, you know, remainder of ten minutes or so of content. Yeah, and and that is over Dave Rubin. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. This was one of the first things we ever talked about because I I yes. knew he had said something critical of Dave Rubin, and I was like, what? I kind of like his show. Um. Yeah. Yeah. This will be fun. <laughs> go. Go. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, what Laura Chen mentioned in in her video was that she she and i think actually this is one of the first videos i've seen of her so i'm not very familiar with her work but from what i tell or from what i can tell i guess she's a moderate conservative am i correct yeah that's fair that's fair okay 
And she was saying that Dave Rubin was not a conservative. Um, and I find that idea to be completely incorrect. And I know he, he – several people say this, but especially he. He perpetuates this. I'm not a conservative. You know, this is their – this is the left's tactic to smear me. I am just the same old, you know, liberal that I've always been. I think, you know, he made a PragerU video, why I left the left, uh, you know, why the left is no longer liberal. You know, everybody's familiar with – or most people are probably familiar with his work. I don't have to go into that. But I think he fundamentally is a right-wing libertarian, and I, th I wish he would just admit that because he, 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 does, he's, he seems afraid to admit that, and I, and I, don't, I don't know why. Uh, yes, he says, oh, I'm pro-gay marriage, I'm pro-choice. Okay, <laughs> so we're supposed to understand your entire political ideology based on those two issues? You know, I, I don't buy that. You know, if you if you watch his, sh I'm, I'm almost done. <laughs> I promise. Yeah. Uh, if you watch his, sh and I, I'm, I feel like I'm taking a bit of a strident, bit, bit too strident of a tone. So I don't, I don't mean to. If if you watch his show, um, again, I, I think he's pretty right wing libertarian. He he he. When he was on Joe Rogan, he mentioned how um, if uh, that a a cake. If someone has a, a a store where they bake cakes for people, that they should be allowed to uh, to to be refu to to refuse <clears throat> to refuse service to a gay person. He um, it, it says in the chart that uh, Sam Harris uh, tweeted out that he is a member of the Republican that he's a republic a registered Republican. Now I, I you know I I'm just going on that tar on that chart. Maybe that chart is completely. <clears throat> in, incorrect. Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll I'll let you jump in here. Okay. So I think we are quickly approaching a argument based on semantics. Um, semantic arguments happen a lot. Um, and yeah, th this is a problem with the left-right spectrum, the conservative to liberal spectrum, and it's annoying and it's awful. So Dave Rubin strikes me as not right wing in the sense that it's he's only right wing if you associate the term right wing with small government right so if you say right wing equals small government then yeah he's obviously right wing um but people would call you know the alt right the furthest people on the right and the alt right aren't known for being small government they're known for being vindictive racists or you know really hardcore traditionalists are considered far right and hardcore traditionalists aren't usually actually that small government of the republicans the republicans are most small government are really closer to libertarians um i would consider myself a libertarian i may consider myself a right-leaning libertarian but i don't really like that that distinction the difference between me and dave rubin is i'm more libertarian than he is because he's actually okay with regulation sometimes which in a weird way I think makes him further right because it makes him more like a Republican than a Libertarian um, because Republicans are usually okay with some of it. But he's pro-choice. Pro-choice is a very, very left-wing value. Um, when, when he takes stances that are beyond questions of should the government allow it, he sounds like a Berkeley, a, a person who went to Berkeley in the 80s, which is why I think he grabs onto the term classical liberal so much is because he thinks of that time when people were like, I can say whatever I want. I can protest whatever I want. I can do this. I can do that. That's my freedom to do it, even though they were Democrats. So he really identifies with that era Democrat, but he knows that that's not what the Democrats are anymore. And I think he's disappointed by that. So he doesn't want to say he's a Republican because he's really only a Republican in the sense that he's for small government. That, that's his big turn, but he's still pro-choice. So I would almost call him left-leaning libertarian just because being pro-choice is such a huge issue. Um, but but here's the thing. Here's the thing. You, you keep associating left with big government things. That's why when I call him a left-leaning libertarian, you don't like that, right? Because you associate the left with people who want to do certain restrictions on businesses or, 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 or you, you even associate the left with uh, things like forcing a baker to make a cake for somebody against his religious conviction. But people in Berkeley in the 80s would probably be okay with that because that's freedom of expression of religion, just, just, just through your business practices. I, I, I don't see why that, that is intrinsically right-wing, except for it's a right-wing guy who's using his rights. It's like if you were defending the free speech of a right-winger, that would be a liberal value, even though it's a right-winger who wants to talk. 
So I kind of reject calling him a right-wing libertarian when he is pro-choice and he's only right-wing in the sense that he's a libertarian. And I think you're falsely classifying libertarians as inherently right-wing because I think the scale is badly designed. I think it's a semantic disagreement. So th- there's a lot there. Yeah. Um, no, I don't, I don't think this is a semantics agreement. I think... Uh, I I think that Dave Rubin is I'm trying to <laughs> put this in a in a diplomatic way. I, I think he's a bit confused, honestly. Yeah, because I would he, agree he, with he, that. he 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 originally and, 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 and by confused I'm not saying oh he changed his mind. I don't I don't mean that. Um but by that I'm I'm sorry. I, I think he's changed his mind a little bit on things over the last few years. I, I don't think he fully knows where he stands on a lot of things, and he's admitted that a few times on air. Well, because yeah, I think he he was basically a, I get you know you, you use the term SJW. That's basically what he was for a yeah. time. He was on the Young Turks, you know, um, he, and he he admits himself that he was a regressive. So. No, I don't. I don't think that libertarians are inherently right wing. I think you can have left wing libertarians and right wing libertarians. I, I, I um, and by by that I'm not referring to the party. I'm I'm referring to lib- libertarianism generally. Um, you know, I I would be more. I would consider myself a left wing libertarian. Again, not with the party and in, in the in when we're talking general definitions. And. Another thing that I wanted to touch on when it comes to Dave Rubin, I think I, I also really dislike, and I, we've also talked about this. I really dislike his interview style. He 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 has a very hands-off interview style. He just lets the guests, you know, he he'll ask a few questions, but he generally just lets lets the guests talk for an hour or so. Um, however long the show is, without really, you know, pushing the guest much. Um, And then, if he is not, if he, if he is not a right-wing libertarian, if he is certainly a left-wing libertarian, then he certainly doesn't show it. (laughs) Because he, he, I, I wish that he would push his guests more um, you know, no, ask more hard-hitting questions because I think he's trying to be a journalist, but on the other hand, he says, no, no, I'm not a journalist. I'm just some guy, you know, talking to people. And once again, I think it's he's confused. He's not quite sure what he wants to be. Does he want to be in the game or does he want to be an observer of the game? And he's trying to be both when I don't think you can be both, honestly. One more thing. He, he says... Um, and to, to illustrate this, he he constantly, well, not constantly, but he quite frequently brings up Larry King. He says Larry King is my uh, my uh, mentor. He he is what I um he, he is who I look up to. He is who I emulate in terms of being an interviewer. But I just think that's a, a, a incorrect c- comparison because Larry King didn't have a political agenda. Dave Rubin clearly does have a political agenda. He might be a bit confused as to what it is, but he clearly has this, you know, this, he clearly is, uh, b- believes that, you know, that the, the SJW culture is running amok. Uh, and I probably agree with that, but, but I just, I, I don't think, to, to summarize, I guess, I, I, I feel as if he's a, putting on a bit of a pose and I, I, uh, I really distaste that. Okay, so I'm going to point out real quick what I agree with you on and what I disagree with you on. I agree with you that he isn't accurately doing what Larry King does. I disagree with you on how much that matters. Because he says that, and I'm like, okay, whatever. Okay, you're not doing that. You say you wish you did. You're not. Okay, that sucks. I don't care. Everything else you said, I also disagree with completely. Um, (laughs) I like to frame it like that. I thought that was funny. Uh, I I I prepped that in my head when I was listening through. Um, I like his hands-off approach because it lets me listen to what the guests have to say. Um, I hate when interviewers push, push back and make stupid points. And a lot of interviewers push back and they make dumb points. And I'm like, wow, you're wasting time on here what this guy has to say. Um, 
to I think pretty much anybody who regularly listens to the Rubin Report knows what they're getting from Dave Rubin. I don't think anybody's surprised or thinks he's misleading them into what he believes. I don't think he knows what he believes a lot of the time. I think he's he leans libertarian. Um, if you want to say he's a right-wing or a left-wing libertarian, it depends how you want to define that. Um, I, th I think like you can call him a left-wing libertarian because he's for small government and he's pro-choice. You can call him a right-wing libertarian because him being for small government means he's against all these kinds of left-wing policies and he's against social justice warriors. Um, but that, that's all a characterization thing and I don't think it's that important of a distinction to make. Um, and he puts, he brings people on his show that are moderate left all the time. He's had all the IDW guys on his show who are center left. He's had the Weinsteins on his show. He's had Nicholas Christakis who went on Joe, he went on Joe Rogan right before Dave Rubin. And I listened to that Joe Rogan episode and had to turn it off because Nicholas Christakis was just, just, he was just crapping on libertarianism with these terrible arguments. And Joe Rogan's just sitting there like agreeing with him. I'm like, I can't listen to this. Joe Rogan's just, yeah, oh yeah, whatever. And then, but, but within that guy who just essentially, uh, degraded Jay Verbin's views goes on the Rubin Report and then you know he gets to talk about his work his work's mostly not political but he's a left-leaning guy and he's open about it and you know that that's a thing I appreciate it the only way he's similar to Larry King is he's willing to have people who talk about a ton of different things on his show because he'll have somebody who's mostly focused on evolutionary biology on his show and then we'll have people who are like you know hardcore anti-immigration on the right but you're right he doesn't push back on anybody I'm okay with that I don't think he's doing it maliciously. I think he's a good intentioned guy. He's just kind of hanging out doing his thing. I don't think there's any problem with that. It doesn't irritate me that he is simultaneously a, jur a journalist and a commentator. Um, I don't think there's an issue there as long as you know how they're biased. That's like when I watch CNN, I know they're, they're kind of both. They're going to tell me the news and they're going to tell me it with a left slant. I know the Daily Wire, Ben Shapiro, is going to tell me the news and tell me his right wing take on it. I'm fine with him doing both because I know where their biases are. Dave Rubin just falls into the same category. Um, so, yeah, uh, we, we're me, me, me taking the two minutes to respond to that because I because I really needed to. I was going to try not to, but I really needed to. It, it's putting us over time. So we, we, we do need to wrap up. Um, I'm glad we got to have some back and forth. That was good. We haven't had to have. We, there have been a couple episodes where we were severely lacking this, and we got to do it a couple of times. So that's good. Um, hopefully, we could find something that's related to Jordan Peterson to talk about next week, and then maybe we can dig a little bit deeper um, onto that. But yeah, do, do you want to have a, a lot last comment before uh, we sign off? Maybe, maybe tell everybody where they can find your uh, your videos, stuff like that. Sure, you can find me on YouTube. Just type in the Anti Philosopher. I have been a bit lackluster in posting videos there, but I'm I'm gonna try to put up more content. Uh, yeah, just you know, I, I, if you really if you enjoy the show, uh, you know, come back every week to listen to us. We we try to we try to post content every on on every um, Tuesday or well Wednesday probably because we were normally recorded on on Tuesday. Yeah. Uh, evening. Um, you know, we, you can find us on uh, Apple Podcasts, uh, SoundCloud. You, well, uh, again, we, on we are on uh, Spotify and Stitcher now. And oh, we, we might are. Be on, we, we might be on iHeartRadio. I'm not sure. I have not checked that email address to see if we are. But we might be. So that's cool. All righty. So y you have plenty of places to find us. And uh, we'll keep on putting out content. Yeah, so, so thank you guys for uh, l listening with us for uh, about an hour there. Uh, so signing off, Matt and Matthew.